officially get it started today. This is our last uh, City Council candidate forum um, for Ward 3. So I'd like to welcome everybody to Meet the Candidates Forum, co-hosted by Noon Kiwanis and Access Television. I am Sarah Duffy, Vice President of Noon Kiwanis. It's our privilege to provide an opportunity for residents to become familiar with the people running for City Council. Today's forum will be broadcast several times on PEG Access prior to the elections on Tuesday, November 8th. We will also update a link to the Noon Kiwanis social media uh, page and the city website. I am pleased to be your moderator for all the forums in this series. And Monday will be our last forum, which will be the mayor uh, forum over the noon hour. Like I said, today we'll meet the candidates from Ward 3. We have Wayne Hurley and uh, Brent Thompson. Ward 3 represents citizens and generally the northwest part of the city. And these residents vote at M State. Before we start today, I'll just go through some of the ground rules that we'll follow. We'll open today with candidates introducing themselves and sharing with us why they are running for city council. You will have three minutes for this introduction. After that, we'll go into the question and answer sessions. We'll rotate who answers first so there is no unfair advantage. The answer period for the question and answer session will be two minutes. Jean here will serve as the timekeeper. She will wave the yellow flag when there is 30 seconds left and the red flag when the time is up. All candidates have seen these questions, so there is no unfair advantage to going first. We'll start the clock when you begin speaking. If you need me to repeat a question, I'd be happy to do so, so just ask me to do that. We'll conclude today by offering each candidate the opportunity to give a closing statement, and that closing statement will be two minutes. We ask that the audience please respectively listen to each candidate's answers and avoid conversations during the forum. Please also hold your applause until the end of the forum and turn off and or silence your cell phones. Are we ready? Yep. Perfect. Again, we'll start with the three minute introduction and Wayne, you can go first. All right, thanks Sarah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Noon Kiwanis for hosting this discussion, helping ensure that voters uh, are well informed about all the candidates this election uh, year. We have a lot of interest in city council, mayoral and school board races, and it's great to see democracy in action here in Fergus Falls. Uh, a little about myself, my wife Tammy and I moved to Fergus Falls in 1998 when I took a job with West Central Initiative. Uh, I'm still employed there today. I'm the planning director there at West Central Initiative. My wife Tammy has worked at the clinic here in town for 18 years, and we have two daughters who attend Kennedy Secondary School, and they've benefited from the excellent education opportunities provided in our community. I've dedicated the last 17 years of my life to serving the community of Fergus Falls. I'm honored to have served on the city council for the last two years and being a, a, appointed in 2015, in January 2015. Prior to that, I had served on both the Planning Commission and the Heritage Preservation Commission uh, for a number of years on each of those committees. And in addition, I serve, uh, currently serve as the President of the Board of Directors for the Ottertail County Historical Society. The reasons I submitted my name to the Council in 2015 are still the same reasons that I want to continue to serve the residents of the Third Ward. I have a passion for Fergus Falls and for making this the best community it can be. Fergus Falls is a great place to work, live, shop, play, learn, and raise a family. My campaign for the third ward council seat reflects my desire to give something back to my community. Um, while I'm not a native of Fergus Falls, this community is my home. It's where my wife and I bought our first house. It's where both of my children were born and have gone to school. <coughs> I'm proud to call Fergus Falls my home, and I take every opportunity that I can to tell folks what a great community this is. These are exciting times for the community of Fergus Falls. We've had new and expanding business uh, opening both uh, downtown and on West Lincoln Avenue. We've had new residential growth with a lot of new multifamily housing developments. And we're beginning an exciting planning process for downtown Fergus Falls and our riverfront corridor. I feel that my background and experience would be beneficial to the community uh, as the city council addresses these important issues facing Fergus Falls now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? Mine won't be quite that long. My name is Brent Thompson, I'm 51 years old. I moved to Fergus Falls back in 2003. I've uh, been married to my wife April for 10 years and I currently work for Anova Industries right here in Fergus. I was born in Minneapolis but spent most of my time moving up and down the west coast of California and Washington. Um, compliments of a father who was a career Navy man. Later on in life I would follow in his steps a little bit. Um, 
finally moving to Illinois and then coming back to Minneapolis on my senior year. I have served in the I served in the United States Navy from 84 to 88 to 1988. I moved to Barnesville back in uh, 2002 with a job opportunity. Meeting my wife ended these moves for me and settling down in Fergus Falls, a town that I have grown to love. My latest endeavor has been bringing back the eyesore on Lincoln Avenue to its original charm and a little bit more. After going to city council meetings for th the past three years, I'm hoping to the opportunity to put that same passion that I put into that house into representing the people of Ward 3. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go into the question answer session now. We have six questions today. The first question involves the local government aid or LGA. With large fluctuations in local government aid, this program and budgeting in general has been an item of concern for the city. Please comment on what you see as priority the city needs to consider in regard to its budget. And we will start with Wayne. All right, thanks Sarah. Uh, yeah, LGA and its impact on our city budget is a very important issue, obviously. Uh, fortunately, LGA has remained stable for the past few years, uh, but unfortunately we can't rely on the whims of the legislature to, to decide what our budgets are going to look like here in Fergus Falls. As such, I'd like to see us continue to make concerted efforts to expand our tax base and tax capacity while limiting our infrastructure expansion. Uh, one specific example of how we can do this is to expand tax capacity through what's called infill development. And if you look at several of the new projects that I mentioned in my introductory comments, all the new commercial growth on the west end of town, uh, the new industrial businesses that are, are business that's being planned in the industrial park, um, the, uh, the new multifamily housing that's taking place uh, all over town, um, it's all been done with very little expansion to our infrastructure. We're using a, existing roads and water and sewer infrastructure to accommodate that growth and development. In addition, we need to take a more practical approach to infrastructure. Uh, when we do need to expand that infrastructure in areas that we need it. And one of the greatest expenses to maintaining our infrastructure, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a major impact on the budget to maintain our infrastructure. And the better job we can do um, expanding in a fiscally responsible way, the stronger our community will be. So, thank you. Thank you. Brent? So basically my major concerns with, would be as far as uh, in, importance would be uh, roads and utilities and infrastructure would be that one we'd have to mess with. The police and the fire department are things that we cannot cut back on in any way, shape, or form. Basically the maintaining of facilities and equipment and basically making sure that our recreational facilities are maintained. Um, once that is done, if we were to have a problem with our budget, then I think as a council we would have to sit down and make the decisions on what is a need and what is a want. Um, basically everything to keep this city open and giving everybody a, you know, a quality of life that they're used to. Um, the one last thing that I will state is listening to some of the previous ones is the LGA. I believe with a few of the others that we should not plan on that when it comes to our budget. That is something that is additional. I think we should learn to live within our budget. If it is there, we need it. If it's not, it can be used, in, like I say, for property tax relief and everything else in town because we want to keep the taxes down in this town because that's what's going to attract people. They're going to look and say, how much does it cost for me to live in this town? And you go to places like Elbow Lake, the tax base on these homes is outrageous. Alexandria is outrageous. You come to Ferguses right now, the taxes are kept pretty low. And that was a major factor for me when I bought my home. I mean, people want to be able to have a lower cost of living and a better quality of life. Good, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next question we will start with Mr. Thompson. And again, it has to do with the budget. The city's 2016 budget is just over $42 million annually. Please tell us about your budget and finance experience and demonstrating how you would be a fiscally responsible candidate. Well, basically, the only experience I have with budgeting, other than my own personal budget, is uh, when I was stationed in Great Lakes, Illinois, I had basically two accounts that I had to maintain. One was a divisional account, and one was what's what they call an Optar account, roughly a $1.5 million budget for cleaning, cleaning and everything else for the Recruit Training Center. Basically, if you don't have the money, you don't spend it. You know, and if you do have the money, you spend it wisely. I mean, I've seen when I was in the military where they came to me and they'd say, hey, 
the, the end of the quarter is coming up. We have to spend this or we're going to lose it the following quarter. I don't agree with that. There's ways to maneuver money, put them into places, and make sure that they are spent wisely. You don't blow money you don't have, and you don't spend money just to make sure you don't lose it the next time around. You have to be fiscally responsible, and I do not agree with any of that. Um, basically, you have to prioritize, and you have to stay within your budget. Um, as far as experience is concerned, the one thing that I've lived by, I had a petty officer, David, once tell me a long time ago, nobody knows everything. Make sure if you do not have the answers, make sure you know somebody who does. You need to surround yourself and know the right people. If you can't get an answer, you need to know and go who to talk to. And when it comes to finance, it's the same thing for me. If there's an answer that needs a question and I don't know it, and I don't know everything, the point is you need to know who to talk to. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harley? Yeah, um, yeah, I would actually agree with Brent. You know, we've got a great finance director, Bill Sonmore, and he's he's a, a valuable resource as we look at our budget every year. So, um, basically, uh, you know, with with uh, regard to experience as far as budgeting and finance, um, my two years' experience on the city council has been given me a pretty good idea and understanding of the city's budgeting process and how it works and all the factors that go into it. It's a fairly complex process, and and so it, there's a there's definitely a learning curve there. Um, in addition, I've been a department director for 15 years. Uh, in that time, I've been responsible for overseeing both federal and state contracts, including managing the budget for those contracts. And so I've got a fair amount of experience there. With regard to fiscal responsibility, it, it goes back to some of the points that I made in response to the previous question and, and into my introduction statement. We need to be wise stewards of the funds that we're responsible for is what it boils down to. As a city, we need to be smarter about how we spend taxpayer dollars, especially on our infrastructure projects. And we need to encourage infill development, which equates to growth of our tax base without the accompanying infrastructure and expansion costs. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question involves economic growth. And I think we've seen a lot of economic growth in Fergus Falls over the last couple of years. You see the strip mall going out by Target. Uh, please describe your vision for economic growth in Fergus Falls and the steps that you will take to achieve progress towards that goal. And we will start with Mr. Hurley. Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, again, we've got great staff at the EIC. Uh, they have a lot of experience, Amy Baldwin and Ryan Miller, um, and also Gordon Idukovich, with the, uh, the, who's the city planner and the uh, Port Authority director, who has a wealth of knowledge and experience. And so we've got great people to rely on there. Personally, I have two, nearly two decades of experience with economic development, and I bring that knowledge and experience to the council. Our staff understands that the key to economic growth no longer involves what they call chasing smokestacks or trying to get that big factory to move to town. It's about growing our existing businesses along with encouraging and attracting entrepreneurs to come to our community. I'd like to share a couple of things that were recently uh, shared with me uh, in an email newsletter. And these are from a gentleman named Maury Foreman, who's a noted expert on economic development. And he recently retired from the Washington State Department of Commerce. Um, he says, uh, economic development is not about jobs. Economic development is about strengthening communities so job creation can occur organically. And he also says a healthy downtown will usually mean a healthy community. A strong downtown could be a major stimulator for economic growth and potentially a key revenue generator for local government. He also says youth will form the backbone of the community for the next 50 years. If they have opportunities to learn new skills, appreciate the community's assets, practice leadership, enter an internship program, and identify and become mentors, your community has a better chance to grow and prosper. So that, those are several reasons why we, I think we need to focus on livability and quality of life. Uh, that'll make Fergus Falls an attractive place for young people and young families and entrepreneurs to move to. And we can do this by continuing to focus on developing a vibrant downtown, to develop amenities like a splash pad for our youth to enjoy in the summer, to continue our efforts to make Fergus Falls a safe place to walk and bike, and to enhance our parks and other recreational opportunities, and also to support our robust arts and culture scene. Those are all important assets of making our community a livable and, uh, and uh, friendly place for families to move to. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? OK. Um, basically, I'm a little bit different than uh, Mr. Hurley here. I do believe we need to attract some more larger businesses of this community. I do believe the downtown needs to be revitalized. I knew there are a lot of vacant spaces down there that need to be filled. And we need to even consider giving special incentives to companies who want to come in and fill these spaces and companies also that want to come in and fill places like Kmart and everything else because it's pretty much people drive by and it looks just like the economy is just down. 
everybody's always asking me why are they building something new when we have something that they can use and with that in mind I mean giving them the incentives to be able to use these existing buildings I believe is you know a crucial idea I do believe that we also need to give incentives and whatever we can to attract larger companies we can no longer afford to let companies like 3M and Bobcat go to Wapaton I mean they're always worried about we don't have the workforce here and I understand they're doing the uh, thing at the school to increase the children's ability to do uh, welding and machine work and everything else and that's great and that'll get them started and that'll get them where they want to go to college and they want to expand on that the only problem is is if you don't have a larger company here that pays he's gonna take his business we are getting aura right now and how many of my well people in my building have left our company we pay fairly decent but aura pays considerably more so we're losing our business to another we're losing our employees to another town so basically what I'm saying is we need to bring in these larger companies with a larger pay and larger benefits because the other thing it's going to do is the money that they earn here they're going to spend here and the money that these companies need the materials and everything they need to buy they're going to buy here so it's going to increase the economy thank you thank you the next question involves your top priorities for the city there are a lot of things that face the council what are your top three priorities for the city and we will start with mr thompson uh pretty much anybody who's talked to me knows what my major one is and that's the one that everybody i talk to not everybody but a very large chunk is the rtc we've dropped the ball on that for way too many years and from what i understand i was at the meetings on monday and we pretty much have dropped it again we have no takers on the property and unless something shows up we turned away contractors we can't afford to keep doing this people are worried of what's going to happen if we get stuck tearing this building down which i don't think is an option it's way too expensive good luck trying to find a hole to put it in in the first place but the point remains is something needs to be done eventually we're going to have to take a risk you know because right now doing nothing is the biggest risk of all so that is one of my top priorities and that and then I understand they're saying that the golf course is in the black the only problem is is how long has it been in the black it's been sucking money out of the system for quite a long time and it needs to be generating income I talked to a lady the other day who believes there ain't a golf course in the country that's making money why you can't get me to believe that I mean even if we have to bring in a private management firm to run this place something we were, I heard about a year ago they were going to bring they were talking about bringing in a consultant I haven't heard anything more on it pretty much promoting economic um, excuse me promoting economic growth which is what I talked in the previous one we need to bring in more more companies into this town and then the last one is pretty much we need to make sure we keep our budget balanced and the one thing I would really like to do is basically see that LGA not be made part of the budget I'd like to find a way to live without it and if any way possible I'd like to be able to see that passed on as a tax break for you know local homeowners and businesses and anything else that it can achieve thank you thank you Wayne well so in a broad sense um, my top three priorities for the city are community livability and quality of life I've talked about that quite a bit uh, attracting economic growth through new businesses and residents I think we achieve that through improving our quality of life and our livability in town and then this one's not uh, nearly as as uh, interesting but working on updating some of our city ordinances that haven't been looked at in a while uh, that would include the zoning code parking regulations and street standards and while those again are not as visible and, and talked about as some of the other things uh, it's never left nevertheless those are very important uh, part of how our community is going to be shaped and how it will grow and develop for the next several decades and so if we get those ordinances tuned up and, and up to date and modernized I think we're going to be set uh, you know for the next several decades uh, in terms of growth and, and future development with regard to specific projects my top three coincide with what the City Council developed uh, last year during our work session when we talked about a strategic plan for the community and in no particular order for me um, it's library expansion Kirkbride redevelopment and Lake Alice improvements so that's what I have thanks thank you a long-standing issue facing the council has been the Kirkbride building 
what is your perspective on the Kirkbride building? And we will start with Mr. Hurley. So the, the first thing I want to say is the Kirkbride's a treasure. It's, it, you know, not many communities in this country have a castle in their town. So um, we, we really are, are fortunate to have a, a significant <coughs> facility like that in our community. Everybody I've ever brought up to the Kirkbride has been amazed by it. And, and we've got a lot of interest in outdoor tours at the museum. Uh, the, uh, the historical site has been doing this year. And there's a lot of interest in getting back to the interior tours as well. Um, so I'd like to see some of those things move forward eventually. Despite the fact that we didn't have any proposals come in, we do have several parties that are interested in the Kirkbride. Um, there are at least six out there that we're aware of that have expressed interest and, and uh, some have toured the Kirkbride. Um, and so we've, we, we need to wrap up the existing infrastructure projects that we've, we've started, get those done, and then decide as a council, and there will be some decisions made next week. We've got a special meeting on Tuesday uh, as to what, what we're going to do moving forward. If we're going to go back to the legislature, I feel that we need to have a very definitive list of projects. We can't continue this, this cycle of um, having money for unidentified projects and coming back and getting de extension or uh, de deadlines extended and, and kind of getting into this, this continuous cycle of that, which is what we've been stuck in for several years. Um, we also need the State Historic Preservation to work with us on identifying what can be demolished and what can't. And I think, you know, if we're going to get hung up on things like whether or not the tunnels are contributing or the powerhouse or things like that, we're, we're going to put the entire property at risk. And so um, that said, there needs to be an end game in sight. We have to get that definitive list if we're going to go back to the legislature and have an end goal in mind of what's going to be done and when it's going to be done. And then from there, the developers that are interested are going to know what they need to do and what they need to put into their proposals so that we can move forward with some redevelopment up there. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I agree with pretty much a lot of what Mr. Hurley has to say. The only problem we've got is we've put in for an extension once before. And with the understanding that we were supposed to be looking at as a worst case scenario and that we were going to get things done, well, the only problem is, is nothing's been getting done until the very last minute. And that's with the fact that it didn't go through. Now we'd be looking at possibly asking them again. I mean, how many times are we going to ask them? Like they said before, this grant's been on the books the longest in Minnesota history. I mean, I just don't foresee them continuing to keep giving us grants on this. Now, the building itself, like I said, I mean, it's one of these things. I don't want to see it torn down. I like old buildings. But the point is, and you know, like you said, it's a gem in this town. But we have to be realistic. And my only concern is how it's going to affect the taxpayers in this town. I mean, when they talked about complete demolition on it, I mean, if I'm correct, it was darn near $1,000 per household. There's a lot of people who just can't afford that. You know, that's one of those things where you're getting down to the point is of cost of living to live in this town. You know, there's a lot of people I've talked to. They say, oh, I love it. I don't want to see it torn down. But then there's a lot of them saying, I mean, they just don't do anything with it. I mean, they keep turning people away. They, you know, they just, they, there's missed opportunities. And I think the missed opportunities need to stop. Um, Jim was correct. I mean, there's going to be parts of it that cannot be saved. You know, you save what you can, you move on with the rest. Eventually, it's going to be, once it's handed over, it's going to be somebody else's problem, and it's no longer going to be the city's responsibility financially. And that's my main concern, is how it's going to affect the people in this town and their taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and one last note. The, the PTSD idea, I do believe, I talked to Bud Nornis once about this about two months ago when they were first talking about it. and if it's even an option that's what the building was originally intended for is for that kind of service and that's what it's designed for and if that can be done i think it would be a fabulous idea thank you thank you the last question today pertains to the commitment it takes to be on the city council as you know serving on the city council is a big time commitment and can be unpredictable tell us about your ability to serve in this capacity and we will start with Brent. Well, that one is long and hard. I had to talk with my supervisor before I even considered doing all this, and he's the one who's been encouraging me to do this the whole long along because he thinks there's a lot of changes that need to be made. Um, the point remains is he's already, before I even got into it, he basically says, whatever you need to do, we will accommodate you. So it's not such a big issue as far as uh, 
me needing time off work in order to do this. And anything on my personal time, I mean, I do plan on regularly walking through my neighborhoods and talking with the people and finding out what their issues are because there's no way you're going to be able to find this out unless you talk with them. So, but as far as that's concerned, I pretty much got a really good supervisor who said we will accommodate you any way you need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hurley? So having worked with local governments in my job over the last 18 years, I knew coming into this that uh, there's a pretty substantial time commitment to being a council member. It's a lot more significant investment of time that's required to do the job well, and it's not just about showing up for a few meetings a month. I think you know there's a lot of people out there that kind of think that, oh, the council members show up for a few meetings, and that's about all they do. Really, you know, a lot like Brent said, a lot of time is spent talking to constituents and talking to city staff and learning about issues and, and addressing those issues and, and coming up with a resolution for them. Um, in addition, there's a lot of other meetings and events and things that can require additional time commitment that are, are not something that's done within the parameters of existing uh, council meetings. Unfortunately, I work for an employer that's been uh, allowing me a pretty very flexible schedule, and so uh, I haven't had any issues at all with attending council meetings. I think over the past two years, I've missed a couple of council meetings. I know one of those was due to a family vacation uh, that we had to schedule around our kids' sports uh, schedules in the summertime. So, um, but other than that, we recently moved our council committee meetings to noon, and that hasn't been an issue. Uh, the 7 a.m. meetings weren't an issue either. So if Andrew decides we want to go back to early mornings. I'm, yeah, I, don't, I agree. I like noon better. Um, but I don't anticipate any having any issues. It's not been an issue over the last two years, and it shouldn't be moving forward. So, thanks. Thank you. Well, this comes to the end of our time for questions. We'll wrap up today by hearing your closing comments from each of you as to why your constituents should vote for you. Each of you will have two minutes for your closing uh, statement, and we will start with Mr. Thompson. Uh, and then Mr. Hurley. So, Mr. Thompson. Basically, I don't come here today with a college degree or 30 years experience on the city council or even being a business owner. I come with a true passion of wanting to give the people of Ward 3 of Fergus Falls a voice at the city council, even if it differs from my own. I do not believe that my word is the final word. I need to be, I was put here or will hopefully be put here to represent you. And that means even if 51% of the people out there believe one way and I believe another, I need to go in the direction that they want me to go. Otherwise, there was no use for even voting me into office. Um, pretty much that's been my whole thing. Um, I've been out there and I actually had one woman, I told her that, and she actually put her hands on her head the other day and she said, oh my God, you're a city councilman. Because she says nobody, nobody listens to them. And that's what I want to do. Like I said, you can't keep everybody happy, but the majority must be. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hurley? Well, so thanks, Sarah. Once again, I want to thank Noon Kiwanis for organizing the candidate forums. I uh, also want to thank Mr. Thompson for a great discussion and encourage everybody to get out and vote on November 8th. I want to close with a thought about how we want our community to develop into the future. Looking back, Fergus Falls peaked in population in 1960. Since then, we've actually seen a 3% decline in our population. Now, if you compare that to other cities in, in the region, um, during that same time period from 1960 to today, Alexandria grew by 76%, Bemidji grew by 47%, Detroit Lakes grew by 60%, Wilmer grew by 88%. Even if we factor in the loss of population due to downsizing at the RTC, we still should have had some modest growth during those decades. Um, if we look at the last two years, we were actually starting to see the beginnings of some of the growth that should have been happening in Fergus Falls over the last 50 years. We have several new you know, multifamily developments, as I've mentioned, the commercial developments that are going on on the west end of town, new businesses downtown, um, plus we have a new owner and developer of the mill. I mean, that, that, that The mill has sat vacant for ever since I've been in Fergus Falls, and so we're finally seeing some action on that. Now, it's not to say that the council can take all the credit for this, but the council sets the tone for what the community is going to look like moving forward, and, and the market's going to respond to that tone. So as a community, I think we need to ask ourselves what we want for the future of Fergus Falls. Do we want to see the you know, repeat of the last 50 years where we haven't seen any population growth and, and, uh, um, and modest uh, growth in other sectors, or do we want to see growth and prosperity like we've seen over the last few years adding new jobs and making Fergus Falls an even better place to raise a family. 
So my goal in serving the citizens of Fergus Falls and specifically the residents of the third ward would be to continue to pursue economic growth in our community by focusing on livability and quality of life. And together we can continue to see Fergus Falls be a great place to work, shop, live, play, learn, and raise a family. And again, I encourage everybody to get out and vote and I'd appreciate your support on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to, on behalf of Noon Kiwanis and Access Television, thank the candidates and everyone for coming today. Um, join us Monday, as I said before, for the uh, debate or the forum for the candidates for mayor. Uh, please also remember to vote on November 8th. Ward 3 voting takes place at M State and polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So don't forget to vote. Thank you.